All right, the title of my sermon this morning, The Faith to Burn, Not Bow. The Faith to Burn, Not Bow. Now, this, the, the stories of Daniel and his three friends, I just find these stories to be extremely inspiring. You know, I don't know about you guys. Um, you know, sometimes when it, you know, we're, we, we want to be inspired by Jesus. We try to strive for Jesus, but we know Jesus is God. We know he's perfect. You know, and we're not perfect. So when we see sometimes... When we see imperfect men do great things, it's very inspiring. Sometimes you see people today, you know, people, maybe men in the world that you, you admire, and you see them do great and bold things. It gives you that kind of fuzzy feeling inside where you just think, wow, what an inspiring act. And I get that same feeling when I read Daniel 3. I just think, man, these guys are so bold, so inspiring. But I think what's great about Daniel and his three friends as well you know, you have different examples of different people in the Bible. You know, obviously Job is a man of suffering and Solomon is wise. Uh, but Daniel and his three friends are such a, a great example of men of great faith, great boldness. And, and we see elements that it's, it's not just they, they go from nothing to Daniel chapter 3. And it's not that they were just bold at one part in their life when you actually see the life of Daniel and his three friends as they're in captivity in Babylon. They're really an example to people, Christians, at all ages, right? Because we see the boldness and the, the faith that they had when they were children. And then here, even when they were older, what they were willing to give up uh, in order to do the right thing. Um, it's extremely, I find it extremely inspiring. And I just wanted to go through the story this morning and hopefully God's word will uh, inspire uh, you all this morning to be uh, great people of faith as well, like uh, Hananiah, <coughs> Mishael, and Azariah were uh, Daniel's three friends. So let's start to see where Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah came from. Daniel chapter 1 it says here, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, <coughs> king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. So we know that eventually the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Samaria, the kingdom of Samaria was scattered. Kingdom of, uh, they came under captivity as well. Kingdom of Judah went into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. So Daniel and his three friends were some of the children that were part of that captivity, carried into the land of Babylon, <laughs> which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favoured and skilful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abdenego. <coughs> so they were brought into captivity, you know, when the Babylonians took over, and they were looking for, you know, these sort of talented children. And of the children of Israel, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael were chosen. And you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me a bit of like those youth leader programs. You know, a lot of organizations are trying to raise up like young leaders. They look for talented people to join them, teach them their ways, teach them how to be good leaders. It's like Babylon had like a youth leaders program, right? And they, they were trying to take the best of the children of Israel and make them great Babylonian leaders. So you can see here that they were accepted into this sort of Babylonian youth leaders program. And everything was taken from them. You know, they lost their homes. They lost their families. You know, likely, you know, their parents are not mentioned. You know, their identities. You think about it, because no, no longer are they keeping the Jewish traditions. They, they're being taught a new language, likely given new clothes. 
um, different foods as well. You know, they're given a portion of the king's meat, different foods that they would not have eaten before. And even their very names, they are given Babylonian names rather than the uh, Jewish names that they had. So this is where these three men came from. Now, <coughs> the overarching point that I'd like you to take home as we read this story, because this story is obviously very familiar. I may point out some new things to you, I might not. But the one thing I want you to reflect on today is that we see these great men in the Bible doing great things. But that's not where it starts. You know, that's why the sermon title is The Faith to Burn, Not Bow. And that faith doesn't come overnight. And this is what we see in the lives of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that it wasn't just one day they woke up and they had the faith to rather burn than bow. We see that it is a build-up. It is a growing of faith over time until they do, you know, do something. They're in a situation to do something great of faith and they have the faith because of the small acts of faith that have built up to it. And that's what we want to look at. So I want to see the three acts of faith through Daniel chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 that builds up to the great climax of Daniel's three friends in Daniel chapter 3. So let's look at the first act of faith. The first act of faith. Daniel 1.8 says here, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So remember, they're in this sort of a youth leaders program and they're given a portion of the king's meat and the king's drink. Now, you know, likely it's defiled in the sense because likely it's offered to idols, right? So the food and the drinks are offered to idols. And here, Daniel wants to take a stand like we see, it's not wrong in and of itself to eat something sacrificed to idols, but when you're eating it, something sacrificed to idols, amongst people that believe that, we read in the New Testament, you know, we don't want to be a bad testament. We don't want to impact others. So I think this is the stand that Daniel's taking here. He knows that that idol is nothing, but he doesn't want to condone the actions of the Babylonians by saying, I'm going to eat this thing that you've offered and and." Basically, like the Bible says, partake of the cup and table of devils. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor uh, with the wine which he drank. <coughs> Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Because remember, he's responsible for raising these children up, making sure they're healthy. They have to stand before the king one day. So Melzar, who's the guy that's looking after uh, Daniel and his three friends, is concerned to say, well, I want to make sure you're eating well, you know, otherwise I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. See, so Daniel and his three friends have the faith to say, you know what, even though we may be worse off because we're not eating the same food, but yet God's going to bless us for that. He's going to give us more in abundance. And we can apply that principle in our lives, you know, especially when it comes to work. You know, people like, they work too much. They work seven days a week. They work, you know, days where they should be doing stuff for God. And we have to have the faith like this, that even if we do less, God is going to bless us over an abundance. He's going to take care of us. Like here, where we, they eat less. They're eating pulse. They're eating vegetables and, and beans and whatnot. And yet, they come out fatter in flesh and wiser than the other children that are with them. He says, prove thy servants. I beseech you. So you see, they're getting proved, but they're, it's their faith in God. They have faith that God is going to take care of them. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. And they say, look, we're, just gonna, we're not going to eat this meat, we're just going to have 
pulse, right? And then just look at us after 10 days. If we're doing well, then let us remember. Because remember, they're going to come before the king three years. So three years they do this. So they're not eating pulse. You know, they're not giving up like this great dainty food of the king and the wine for just like a week. They're saying, prove us for 10 days. And then three years later, like, you know, when they come before the king. <clears throat> At the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away a portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. So this is the first act of faith where they take the stand to go, you know what, we're not going to eat things to sacrifice ourselves. We're not going to eat defile ourselves with the king's meat. But notice, it wasn't the three friends that purposed in their heart. Who was it? It was Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart, and he actually inspired, encouraged his friends to take that step of faith as well. So we see that the journey of Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah didn't even start with them leading the way. So you know that's why to have to start the journey of faith, it doesn't have to be you being Daniel, right? But it definitely helps having a friend like Daniel. So that's why you want to be around people that are going to inspire you to take the stands of faith because, you know, Daniel purposed in his, his heart. And, and let me ask, ask yourself this question. If Daniel did not purpose in his heart to do the right thing in this instance, would, he, would his friends have been so bold? You know, would his friends have been so bold? And would they have started this journey because maybe if they had compromised here when they were kids they would have compromised in chapter two you know they wouldn't even be part of the story then then maybe we wouldn't have even got chapter three so there's two thoughts there that i think are quite profound one is you know it's all right to not be the the pointy end of the spear but if you're not you know make sure you are around people because if you're not around people like daniel i mean how is that hindering your faith but from a leader's point of view, it also makes you think, man, this is the, the faith of one person can change the course of those around them. And it, ma it makes you reflect on your own life to think, man, if I was more bold in my faith, what changes would occur in the lives of people around me? Right? So you see how there's that double-edged sword there where, yes, we want to make sure we are around because our lives can be impacted. But what sort of impact can we have if we are great people of faith and the untold stories that could occur if we had done something as simple as Daniel did in chapter 1? So let's go on. Daniel 1.17, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king, king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. <coughs> I think it's interesting as well that the author of the book still refers to them as their Hebrew names. So it's like in God's eyes, you, that he sees the real identity, even though on the outside of the world they try and change them, but God sees the heart. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So even though they saw they took a hit as a, as a step of faith, and yet at, at the end they were ten times better, tenfold better they came out than those that took of the king's meat. They took the easy route, right? So what do we learn here in chapter 1? And, and the main sort of thrust of this sermon as we get to the climax in chapter 3 is, you know, faith can grow. Faith doesn't just start as this great... It's not like you're just given this great faith to, to burn rather than bow, you know. It, it's building up, and it builds up through obedience in the small things. See, we learned about this not long ago when the apostles asked Jesus Christ in Luke 17, the apostles said unto the Lord increase our faith and the lord said if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed ye might say unto this sycamine tree be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you but which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle 
or say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank this, that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. So I won't spend too much time on this passage because I did in, that, in the sermon previously when I talked about this. But what is the crux of the lesson here in Luke 17? If we want our faith to grow, we have to have the attitude of this unprofitable servant that we humbly, in obedience, obey God, not expecting anything, not thinking that we're doing God any favours, and that's how we grow our faith. We grow our faith through obedience to God's word. And that's how that mustard seed of faith will grow to the point where one day, you know, when it grows to that point, it does great things, it can, move, it can move mountains. Mark 4, this is how the mustard seed works, right? <clears throat> he says here, ah, see, I must, be, I must be like getting the wrong verses here, but uh, let's go on. <laughs> that's the point I'm making there. So obedience grows faith. Obedience grows faith. So we want to have an obedient attitude to grow our faith. That's why I have this verse here. Now I'm reminded. This is how it works, right? If we use the faith we have that God has given us, he adds more to it. But if we don't then that's when people start to get less bold, gets taken away. This is why I wanted to go to Mark 4.24. He said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, for with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. You see, why is that related to obedience and faith? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And when you obey, you walk in faith. So if you are hearing God's word and you're willing to walk in God's word, then more is going to be given to you. This is how we grow our faith. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. So you see there, faith is not just something you just have or you don't have. Everyone has that mustard seed of faith. How do you grow that faith? You grow that faith by obedience, right? Now, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, I mean, they were children. So you see how the act of faith started when they were young. And they were taken into captivity without their parents. So not only are they children, taking a stand without their parents. But you know that they must have had a decent upbringing, right? Parents that taught them to take a stand of faith so that when they weren't there, they still, you know, were willing to take that stand of faith. Like Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So you see how the faith even started with their parents. That faith was then imparted to the children, and the children's faith grew as they took the stand here, and that was the first act of faith. So, what's a lesson here as well? Faith with the big starts with the small, right? We have to be faithful in the small things if we're gonna be faithful in the big things. Because think about at this stage, at this stage of their life, does anybody even know what's going on? No, right? I mean, if they had just, if they had just eaten the king's meat and eaten the drink, and drunk the king's wine, I mean, who would have known any different? Right? So you see how this, this act of faith is something that was done in private amongst the friends and Melzar. As far as everyone else knows, and maybe, maybe there's a small group that knew that they were eating pulse wine, but as far as the public, when they stand before the king, they don't know he's, that they've been eating pulse and taking this stand. But you know, God knows and they know. 
right? So it built their faith, even though it didn't do something great. It wasn't something that was openly public. They were building their faith. So that's why we have to be faithful in the small things if we're going to be faithful in the big things. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous famine, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? I remember hearing uh, a speech online. And you know how uh, people come and they give speeches at those colleges trying to inspire young people. And I remember the speech started by saying, if you want to change the world, you can start by making your bed. You know, you start with the small things. And I think it's like that in the Christian life too. If you want to do great things for God, well, you can start by reading your Bible. You can start by praying faithfully. You can start by coming to church consistently, on time. You know, you can start by doing the small things. You do the small things, and then your faith grows, and then you'll do the big things. And that's what Luke 16 is teaching us, right? We're going to be faithful in the least, and then we'll be faithful in much. So a lot of people, you know, they talk about doing the right things later. You know, I've heard it a lot in my life. When people say, oh, you know, when I'm, when I'm older, you know, kids will say, when I'm older, that's, that's when I'm going to take faith seriously. You know, then, then they're single. They say, you know, when I get married, that's when I'm going to be serious. Because now that I'm married, I'm going to take things seriously. And then when they get married, then it's like, well, when I have kids, you know, that's when I'm going to take things to God seriously. Because I'm going to be a good example of my kids. You know, and they're busy, and then it's like, oh, you know, that's when I'm retired. You know, I'm going to have the time. To they're always pushing it off. But you know what? If you're not faithful now, you're not going to be faithful later. You know, so you don't want to deceive yourself. You don't want to kid yourself. You're going to be faithful in the small things. And then that's how you build your faith, to be faithful in the big things. And that's why these guys, they didn't get to chapter 3 by not going through chapter 1. This is their first act of faith. Right? Jeremiah 12.5 says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusteth they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? What is this verse saying here? You're not going to be able to run with horses if you can't even run with men. And you're not going to be able to swim in the swelling of Jordan when you can't even swim in a peaceful lake. So it's like these small things, right? <coughs> so it's got to be small first. It builds like that mustard seed. It grows, it grows, it grows. So don't have this expectation of just doing great things. It's got to grow from the small things. Let's have a look at their second act of faith in chapter 2. The second act of faith. Daniel 2, chapter 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dung hill. Uh, now, this story is a little different. It's very similar to the story of Joseph and Pharaoh. I remember Pharaoh dreamed a dream, but there's a big difference here. Pharaoh remembered what he dreamed. He just didn't know what it meant. And this scenario is very different. This scenario is King Nebuchadnezzar dreams a dream. He doesn't even remember what the dream is. And he's telling the wise men, I don't only want you to tell me what it means. I want you to tell me what I actually dreamed. Tell me what I dreamed and tell me what it means. And he says, if you don't, then I'm basically going to destroy all of you. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. So the two extremes, you either succeed and be lavishly rewarded, or you fail and I will wipe you off the face of the earth. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, 
I know of a certainty that you would gain the time. He says, you know, he knows once I tell you, you know, you're going to just figure out some interpretation. Because you th see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. What is he saying? Because likely these wise men are talking about, you know, how great their gods are. They have all these things, they know all these things. And then he's like saying, well, now I've dreamed a dream, I've forgotten it. If you, if you truly are these men of God or men of the gods, you know, then, you know, now you've just been lying before me. And I shall know that you, shall, you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things as any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king require it. And there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well, aren't they meant to be ones that are soothsayers of, thing, of gods? But there, for this cause, the king was angry, very furious, but commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now, remember, this includes Daniel, Hananiah, <coughs> Mishael, and Azariah. So, skip down to verse 15. This is Daniel's response when he hears about what's happening because obviously he wasn't there when, you know, uh, I'm not sure why, but he wasn't there when, he, uh, he was, uh, when the other wise men were initially called. He answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? It's like, like why all of a sudden does he want to kill all of us? Then Ariok made the thing known to Daniel. So Ariok explains to Daniel what, what happened, you know, the dream and everything like that. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. So this again is a great step of faith on Daniel, Daniel's part because he, he, he's trusting that God will preserve them. He just says to the king, hey, we're going to get you that interpretation. right?" Then verse 17, look at this. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. You see there, sometimes faith isn't praying to God, asking what the right thing to do is, because you already know what the right thing to do is. See, here Daniel did the right thing. And now he's just praying that God will deliver them through that. So, you know, that's what, that shows great faith because you already know God's word. He already knows what the right thing to do is, but now he's going with his three friends and they're going to pray to ask God to actually bring them through this right path that they have to walk down. And God delivers them. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So God comes through for them on this in, in this instance and in, and in all the instances here. So what's the lesson we can see here? You know, what builds faith? I mean, being in a dire situation where you have to fully rely on God. I mean, those situations can be good because they build our faith. They teach us how to depend solely on God because we are forced into a situation that is completely outside of our control and that's what we see here they trust god and god delivers them through it and this is how this situation with daniel and the dream so i won't go through the whole story but obviously he gives the dream and the interpretation and all that there's a lot of prophetic truth in that this is how they are raised up to be quite now not just wise men in the babylonian kingdom but actually quite high-profile rulers within Babylon. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Right? So Daniel is ruler over the whole province and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Look here, and then Daniel takes care of his friends. 
Then Daniel requested of the king, and he sent Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So now it's interesting there that now they're referred to as their Babylonian name. Over the affairs of the province of Babylon. <coughs> so Dan but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So we see that Daniel is like the right hand man now to the king, taking care of the provinces. And then he has his three rulers you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So this is how, in our chapter one, chapter two, they rise to that position. So they didn't start there, right? So remember, the overarching thing I want you to learn today, I want you to see the growth in faith till we get to chapter three, where the title of the sermon comes from, the faith to burn, not bow. So this is the third act of faith, and the, the last one we hear about, Daniel's three friends. Daniel chapter 3, this is the story of Daniel's three friends and the fiery furnace. So notice the first two acts of faith. Who led the way? Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel said, hey, we'll have the interpretation of the dream. Encouraged his friends. But here now we see in Daniel chapter 3, we see the three friends of Daniel take a stand without Daniel, right? So they now have, so Daniel's helped grow their faith, but now they, you know, that helped them to now take this stand of faith, even without Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the, uh, cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So this story obviously parallels, you know, the end times where it's going to be a image built of the beast and the people are going to have to worship the image. Same thing. And believe the people that don't are going to be killed. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, counselors, sheriffs. Oh, I'll try and skip over those just because, you know, it basically gets together, makes this image, gathers all the people, the rulers of the land to the Together, look at this, verse 3, unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. <laughs> then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Now, what made me think here in Daniel chapter 3, he's, he's building this image, right? So, you know, the, the, the Jews, the, the Jewish kids, well, they're probably not so young now. They would have known that this image was getting built in the plain of Dura. But what I wonder is, would, the, would they have known that at the dedication of this statue, that... King Nebuchadnezzar is going to say, you know what, and now I'm going to play music, and if you don't bow down to the image, I'm going to kill you. Do you think they, do you think they knew that? So my point is that the faith of these men was so great that even when they didn't have much real time to think about what they were wanting to do, they already knew without hesitation what they would do. And that just, that's, that just shows the faith that these men had. And it's a, it's a great thing. It's something that we should, we should strive for, something we should follow. But I had that thought when I was, you know, preparing for this sermon. Is It's not like there was much real time to really think about what to do and the consequences and all this. They just went with what they knew was the right thing to do. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, so then it says they played the music, everyone bowed down and worshipped that golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. <coughs> now, I don't know what is going through your mind, but I always imagined that when this happened, they were there standing up. But I don't think that's the case, right? I don't believe 
based on what I'm reading and my understanding. I don't think they were actually even there at that dedication. Because if they, if they were there at that dedication, Nebuchadnezzar would already know that they're these Jews that are not respecting, right? Because, because if everyone's going to bow down and then his, the, 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 the three people that are taking care of his promise are, he would have already known at that point. So what I think happened is this, this, this image is being built up. They're like the highest profile people in, in Babylon and the king's called everyone. And you know what happened? They didn't even go. They don't even go to this dedication of this image. That, that's why he doesn't know that they don't respect, he does, they, they're not respecting his image because they weren't even there. It wasn't until verse 8, it says, wherefore at that certain time, Chaldeans came in and accused the Jews. So it's like when, you know, it, later on, when they make, you know, when Darius makes the decree that they can't pray to any god except, um, I think, they, uh, to, except the king. They're doing that in order to bring something against them. And whether this was just they didn't like Jews or whether it was political, right? Because it's political because they're like the three rules. Now they're, these guys, these Chaldeans may be thinking, well, we can get rid of Daniel, and, and Azariah, and Ananiah, Mish, you know, Mishael. Hey, there's, there's now a vacancy in those roles, isn't it? So it may just have been the love of money wanting to get rid of them. But this is how it is made known to the king. He says, you know what? They're these Jews. Then spake said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. So you see how they're just like sucking up to King Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the, the music, I'll just give her, not worship the golden image. Verse 11, Whoso falleth not down and worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee so why would they say, say that? Because I think they weren't even there. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So maybe Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, he's gonna say, he probably doesn't even know who's like taking care of his pride. He's like forgotten. He's put them in charge. He says, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. <coughs> so what happens next? Nebuchadnezzar spake, said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? So the scenario, I think, is what hap happened is they had the dedication. They're not even there. Then people tell them, you know what? There's these people that don't, don't even want to be here, don't respect, don't want to worship your gods. So then he calls for them. Now they come to where everyone is. So now there's the scenario that we see in our mind where the music plays, and they're not standing, but they're not bound. But I think this happens now when they are called to come to Nebuchadnezzar. Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So you see, this is now the first time they are tested in this particular scenario. I think they weren't there before. So it's not that they did it the first time and then he's checking the second time. Hey, you guys didn't bow. I think now he's like saying, I, I'm told that you don't respect my gods. You don't want to serve them. I want to see, are you loyal or not? You know, to, to my gods. And this is like these next couple of verses, these three verses, you know, I don't know if they give you the same tingling feeling that I get inside when I read these verses. I just think, whoa, this is just amazing courage, boldness, faith. Not just what they say and what they do, but how they go about it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answer and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, look at this, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter, right? So they're saying they're not concerned about how they, they're answering. They're not taking this lightly. They are saying plainly to the king without hesitation, this is our position on this. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us 
from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So they're saying, God's going to deliver us out of our, our hand. And you know, maybe they have the faith that's building up because God delivered them in the beginning from eating the meat and then delivered them from being killed because of the dream. They have somewhat to base it on. Hey, God's delivered us two times. He's going to deliver us this third time. But verse, uh, verse 18 is the clincher and shows the real heart and real faith of these people because many people throughout time, many Christians throughout time have taken the step of faith, taken that, that stand of faith and not been delivered. Right? We see in Revelation how many people were slain for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. They took a stand and yet God did not deliver them like he delivered Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. But what I want you to see, and what we see in verse 18, is that they were willing to be like them. And that's why they, they, you know, such an inspiring story, because look at what they say here in verse 18. It says, but if not, even if God doesn't deliver us, and they're saying this to the king, they're saying this in front of everyone. Remember, they're at this dedication. So, you think about the scenario, I mean, we'd be nervous. You'd be nervous, first of all, just the publicness of it. And then think about what's at stake. You think you have things at stake. Look at these guys. These guys are the three top rulers right under Daniel of all of Babylon, the world kingdom at that time. And think about the, the, the pressure, the privileges that they're going to lose, you know, and, and their life even. And yet, in the face of all that, they say, even if God, we believe God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not do what you're asking us to do. We would rather burn than bow. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Wow, like what a stand of faith. So, how do they have this faith? Well, like we learned about in this sermon, faith grows. And it grows to the point where it's like what Hebrews 11 says about Moses. Look what Hebrews 11 says about Moses. This is a chapter of faith. He says, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at this, verse 5. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see how it requires faith to realize that the riches and privileges and reputation and even your very life is more valuable than doing what is right, taking that stand for God. And that's what Moses learned. This is what Daniel and his three friends learned. They learned, like verse 26 says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So you see how it starts small and then it grows. Because if doing, giving up the small thing just to do what's right small, you're not going to do. I mean, if you're not willing to give up, you know, a hundred bucks or 50 bucks or whatever to do what's right for God, do you think you're going to give up a hundred thousand dollars? A million dollars? I mean, these guys were the top high profile people. So people think, oh yeah, when they're at the top, that's when they're going to take a stand for God. No, if you can't do the ten dollars, the fifty dollars, give up the small things, you're not going to give it up when there's so much more at stake. Right? And that's why it's got to start with the small things. You're faithful in the small things, you'll be faithful in much and you grow your faith to the point where you esteem the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, or even the treasures in Babylon, or the treasures in Australia. For we have respect unto the recompense of the reward. Man, what men of faith. How different would the world be were it filled with Christians of faith like these men? You know, it's a rare thing, but how, how different the world would be. I mean, look, just one man, Daniel, doing, doing this act of faith, 
changed the course of what happened in Babylon with these three men. And now these three men, you know, we're not going to read the rest of the chapter. We saw it. Hey, it worked out for them. But it doesn't always work out on earth. But it's going to work out in the end, you know, in heaven. So, what's a key part of this sermon? They were men of great faith, but their faith didn't grow to this point overnight. Now, you want to have a great faith, it's going to start with the small things. Matthew 13, 31, our faith like a mustard seed. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, see, it has to grow, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So the last lesson is, you know, God has given all of us the potential to be a person of great faith. See, the potential is there. He's given the measure of faith to every man. You have that mustard seed. But I believe whether you walk in faith will determine how big that mustard seed grows. Right? So if you want to grow your faith, we have to start living by faith, doing acts of faith like we see in these men here. So just a recap, lessons. Faith of one person can change the course of those around them. Second one, faith with the big starts with the small. And number three, hey, being in dire situations where you must completely rely on God, you know, that builds your faith. So we saw that in chapter two. And in chapter three, you know, they did great things, but... I want you to know this morning that that same great faith, that potential of that great faith is in you as well. But we've got to grow our faith. Right? So let's grow our faith and be great people of faith. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you. I love this story. I love the story of Daniel and his three friends. It's an inspiration not only to those of us who are older, but even those of us who are younger. And uh, just pray, Lord, that you help us to increase our faith, help us to be obedient and walk in faith, and may our faith grow. And I pray, Lord, that you will use each and every person in our church to do great things for you, uh, like we see here with Daniel and his three friends. So, Lord, help us. Increase our faith. Use us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.